The voice of David Ben-Gurion declaring the establishment of the State of Israel in May 1948. The Balfour Declaration was a letter sent by British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour to a member of the British House of Lords, Lord Rothschild, on the 2nd of November, 1917. This letter, sent to a leading figure in the British Jewish community a hundred years ago, had repercussions which even its authors cannot have imagined. Whatever its real intentions, it went on to have a profound impact on the Middle East and its people. And its effects still resonate across the region today. In 1914, these soldiers were fighting on the battlefields of Europe in the First World War. The Allies, Britain, France and Russia fought the Central Powers of Germany, Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire for four years. But the land and sea war was not the only battleground. Muscle was also being flexed behind closed doors as Allies conspired how to redraw maps to their own advantage when the conflict eventually ceased. Sir Mark Sykes for the British and François-Georges Picot for the French plotted how to divide the Arab lands of the Ottoman Empire, assuming it would finally fall. The Sykes-Picot agreement planned secretly to divide it into French and British spheres of influence. France taking most of the Levant, southern Anatolia and the Mosul area, while the British extended their control over the southern Levant, expanding eastwards to Baghdad and Basra, and all the land between the Arabian Gulf and the French territory. Historic Palestine, then still part of the Ottoman Empire, was a bone of contention and would be put under international administration. La Palestine Français, anglais et russes n'arrivent pas à s'accorder parce que tout le monde veut avoir la Palestine. Pourquoi Parce que, d'une part, la Palestine, la France a de très riches souvenirs en Palestine et l'Angleterre, elle, c'est surtout la position de la Palestine qui l'intéresse parce que la Palestine est relativement proche du canal de Suez. Le canal de Suez, c'est la voie qui mène à l'Empire des Indes. On décide de créer un régime international d'internationaliser la Palestine. Quand on a eu le temps de faire un travail, on a eu le temps de faire un travail, there had not been enough government involvement in concluding the Sykes-Picot agreement with the French. And in that process, they had not really protected their interests well enough for a post-World War era in which the British Empire would continue to seek to be a dominant force in European affairs. And so, really, officials across Whitehall, including Mark Sykes himself, felt it was a bad deal. <laughs> أعتقد أثيرت مسألة إنه في هناك حركة صهيونية وإنه في هناك جزء من اليهود يطمحون بالعودة إلى فلسطين وأن يكون لهم يعني وجود في فلسطين وكيان في فلسطين وأنا أعتقد إنه هذا المناخ هو الذي أطلق 
العملية أطلق العملية التي أدت إلى إعلان بيرفورد. And it's of huge significance that when they're making these discussions, Jews and Zionism are not discussed. Jews were not to feature in the new cartography of the Middle East, which was to be based on the idea of the Arab nation. Zionism was the movement supporting the re-establishment of a Jewish homeland in the area it defined as the historic land of Israel. The movement was active in early 20th century London, especially because of the persecution of Jews in Russia and Eastern Europe. Theodor Herzl had founded the Zionist movement in the late 19th century, but Jewish people in Western Europe had not rushed to support it because they were integrating quite successfully into society. Zionists believed that all Jews should someday return to that country. One of the problems was that Palestine belonged to the Ottoman Empire, and the Ottoman Empire um, was not clear that it wanted massive Jewish immigration into Palestine. And the British government offered to let Jews move unimpeded in great numbers into Uganda if they wished. Um, but in any event, it really didn't happen. And it didn't happen because a majority of Zionists felt that Herzl was selling them out and that the only place for Jews to move back to, or at least conscious Zionist Jews to move back to, was Palestine. In this, I think, Britain began to look on the Zionist movement as a possible partner in justifying a renegotiations of their agreement with the French. You see, for Britain simply to claim territory against what they'd already concluded in an agreement with France could create diplomatic problems for the British. But if they were to make a claim to Palestine, not out of self-interest, but in order to advance a great historic ideal of the restoration of the Jewish people to their biblical homeland, that this could justify an adjustment of the terms of Sykes-Picot in a way that the French would accept. The British wanted somehow, uh, and, and more and more increasingly, they felt that the Jews held the key to winning the war. Um, and so they had to figure out how to bribe the Jews to support them. Sir Mark Sykes had succeeded in drawing the line he wanted from Acre in the west to Kirkuk in the east. But for some in government, this was not enough. The British were using the Jewish national movement to secure Palestine for themselves. This is when Heim Weizmann is really going to find open ears in 10 Downing Street, in the Foreign Office, in the Colonial Office. And it's paving the way towards that critical decision in November of 1917. And so I think you can, direct, you can draw a direct connection between Britain's sudden acknowledgement of Zionism as an idea and an ideal and what they were dissatisfied with in the terms of Sykes-Picot. Chaim Weizmann was a chemistry lecturer in Manchester who had become a prominent member of the British Zionist movement. He was politically well-connected and rubbed shoulders with senior figures in government. So Chaim Weizmann was uh, Russian by birth. He was a chemist. Um, and then he joined the Zionist movement. Um, he climbed in the Zionist movement. He moved to Great Britain before the war, well before the war, maybe 10 years before the war began. He was not before the war very well known in the English Zionist movement. He was pretty well known in the World Zionist Federation, um, but he was by no means the most visible Zionist when World War I began in Great Britain. Weizmann later wrote in his memoirs about having been introduced to a British government minister, Herbert Samuel. Samuel was Jewish, but Weizmann was apparently concerned that he might be anti-Zionist. However, Herbert Samuel turned out to be extremely receptive to Weizmann and went on to write an official memo in 1915, setting out a number of different possibilities for Palestine and the Jewish people. Uh, 
هيلث مينستر هيك شيء يعني فهو كان ما له علاقه يعني مفروض انه ما له علاقه بالسياسه بس هو كتب مذكره عن فلسطين لما لقى انه الظروف اللي طلعتها الحرب العالميه الاولى لقى حاله انه هو اول يهودي ذو يعني مركز موجود بالحكومه البريطانيه كتب مذكره للحكومه انه شو بده يصير بفلسطين بعد ما تنتهي الحرب وحط عده احتمالات احدى الاحتمالات انها تصير دوله يهوديه او تصير تحت الحمايه البريطانيه فلسطين او تصير بطل يسميها دوله يهوديه الكومنولث يعني كيان but he didn't find willing ears in Whitehall or in the colonial office for schemes that involved the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine. Britain was really concerned with two things by the time that the First World War had broken out. They wanted to win the war first and foremost. This was an imperative for the survival of Britain and its empire. And secondly, they wanted to ensure that coming out of the war victorious, that their empire would benefit from the victory. So at this stage, Chaim Weizmann's and Herbert Samuel's ideas about the rights of the Jews to resettle in Palestine did not find much sympathy in the corridors of power in London. A disappointed Weizmann wrote to a friend asking whether there wasn't at least a discussion to be had about what he called the chance for the Jewish people. I realize, of course, he went on, we cannot claim anything. We are much too atomized for it. What the debate did do, however, was to throw together Weizmann, the Russian Jewish immigrant searching for a homeland and refuge from persecution, with Herbert Samuel and Lord Rothschild, firm members of the British Jewish elite, established in society and part of the political and capitalist class. Zionism, for the most part, across all of the community was actually in the minority, but certainly most of all within the Jewish elite, because it threatened the notion of them as 100% committed members of British society. And this was complete anathema for somebody like Edwin Montague, who became Secretary of State for India. For him, Zionism is his worst nightmare. The idea that Jews are not satisfied simply with being citizens of Britain or other countries around the world, but always longing to go back to the land of Israel. For him, he wanted to demonstrate that the Jews of Britain were first and foremost British. It's important to remember that for people like Rothschild, Zionism had actually been a threat. You see, the elite in British Jewry had fought for generations to gain acceptance in British society. It was only with the arrival of Disraeli in the 19th century that Jews entered Parliament and could rise to become Prime Minister. And for people of high finance or banking interests, the real elite of the Jewish community in Britain, their struggle to demonstrate their place in British society meant that Zionism, with its claims that Jews were a people apart and should be a nationalist movement in their own right, were anathema. وبالتالي لا ينبغي يعني تقدير الحركة الصهيونية في ذلك الوقت باعتبارها حركة كل يهود الأوروبا الغربية وأن هي كانت تلقى دعم من كافة أو من أغلبية يهودية في أوروبا الغربية. هذا من جهة من جهة أخرى يعني الأدلة تشير إلى أنه المسؤولين البريطانيين في المرحلة بعد ربيع 1916 هم الذين سعوا للحديث مع المسؤولين الحركة الصهيونية وليس العكس. فيتمان أفين شمش خشوف ذا لافين لو ما إنترس الصهيوني لو ما إنترس البريطي كي درخ إنترس البريطي ويخال לקדם את העניין הציוני. כלומר, ויצמן לא השלה את עצמו, הוא לא חיפש אינטרסים משותפים. It's Weizmann that makes the difference, and I think he was probably unique in his ability to persuade leading British figures that the Jews were 
in fact, a vast subterranean influence, which they were not, um, that all Jews were Zionists, which was far from the truth, and that therefore the key to winning Jewish support was to offer them Palestine. Weizmann talked up the degree to which the Jewish community supported Zionism in order to get his message across to the government. But for the British, it seemed to be about self-interest, about winning the war. Recognizing Zionism would be closely linked to gaining global Jewish support for this objective on which it saw its future resting. So the British motives for supporting Zionism, really we can boil it down to two elements of British self-interest at that time. Not an emotional interest in Zionism or a love of Jews and the Jewish plight and a desire for a return of the Jews to the Holy Land. No, for very specific self-interest matters of policy. They were, first of all, all of the British government agreed that they wanted to mobilize behind Britain and the Allies this idea of Jewish power in the world. They were, like all of the different policy elites in the war, believers in the notion that Jews were of tremendous influence in the corridors of power around the globe. If the British government appeared to support Zionism, they would win over world Jewry to their side and all that that entailed. The British were convinced that Zionism was really at the center of the Jewish heart. In May 1916, Sir Mark Sykes had agreed his secret deal with the French. Sykes-Picot would form the basis of the future carve-up of the old Ottoman Empire. So he immediately turned his attention to Palestine, still part of the Ottoman Empire, and how to use Zionist ambitions to outmaneuver the French. Formal contact between the British government and the Zionist followed. He immediately phoned Herbert Samuel and told him about the plan. And Herbert Samuel then phoned Chaim Weizmann, and Weizmann brought with him Nahum Sokolow. This meeting took place on the 11th of April, 1916. It took place at Moses Gaster's house in Maida Vale. Um, and Gaster wrote in his diary afterwards how proud he was that this meeting, which he thought was the most important meeting that had ever taken place in the history of Zionism, uh, had taken place at his house. أول ما مارك سايكس يعني تعرف على الحركة الصهيونية أول شيء اتصلوا مع جاستر لأنه هو كان الممثل تبع الجالية اليهودية بس بعدين راح دوره ووايزمان هو اللي اللي يعني سطع النور تبعه وهو اللي سيطر على كل الموضوع. And Moses Gaster very quickly understands that Sykes is looking to gain support from supposed Jewish power in the world. And Gaster works with this idea and manipulates this to consolidate Sykes' interest in Zionism. And we see, actually, the British government becomes very close, already in 1916, of issuing a public declaration in support for Zionism. Now, in the end, this doesn't happen that year. The plan Sykes got Herbert Samuel to pass on to the Zionist leaders involved joint British-French administration of Palestine and a charter guaranteeing British support for Zionism. But his idea was rejected. They didn't want an Anglo-French condominium in Palestine. They wanted the British uh, to protect them, not the French, and that's because they thought that the French always sort of converted their colonized people into becoming Frenchmen. And what they wanted was to remain as self-conscious Jews. And they thought that the British uh, would leave them alone and let them do that. I think that what Herzl and also Weizmann and Sokol and others are saying is that the British are probably going to make a decision that is not so good, אבל הם מוכנים לדבר עם התנועה הציונית כנציגת העם היהודי. צריך לזכור שהתנועה הציונית הייתה מיעוט קטן בתוך העם היהודי. רוב היהודים לא היו ציונים. והנה באה המעצמה, אולי המעצמה החשובה ביותר בעולם, ואומרת, הנה אתם 
הפנים הרשמיות של היהודים, מוכנים לסגור איתכם עסק. Bolstered by their newfound credibility, the British Zionists thought about making specific demands after the Sykes meeting. But events soon overtook them. On the 6th of December 1916, British Prime Minister Asquith resigned. In the change of government, Arthur Balfour became Foreign Secretary under Prime Minister David Lloyd George. Lloyd George. Is he as he... بارز في ال في حزب الاحرار في ذلك الوقت ثم اصبح رئيسا للوزراء منذ ديسمبر 1916 يقال انه انه تلقى يعني تربيه وتعليما مسيحيا بروتستانتيا وانه ربما يعني هذا قد ساعد في في تقبله لفكره Balfour was uh, of rather philosophical bent, uh, and I, I think he uh, wanted to think in theological terms, uh, he wanted to think in historical terms, um, uh, and it, it was with that frame of mind, I think, that, that he uh, approached the whole question. Yes, it التفاوض مع الصهاينة ومحاولة البحث عن مخرج من اتفاقية ساكس بيكو هذه السياسة وصلتها حكومة لويد جورج يعني تماما كما بدأتها حكومة أسكوث وبلفور بصفة وزير الخارجية كان أصبح يعني جزء مهم من هذه من هذه العملية David Lloyd George, A.J. Balfour, and all of those who supported the Balfour Declaration within the British government, we can absolutely categorize as being riven with anti-Semitic thinking. And not only that, but the thinking behind the Balfour Declaration that drove them to the Balfour Declaration was from this anti-Semitic thought. The idea of Jewish power, of Jewish cohesiveness, and of a unified Jewish attachment to Zionism above all else. Whatever its basis, the relationship between the British Zionists and the government would continue to grow throughout 1917, leading to the declaration that would change the face of the Middle East and ultimately determine the destinies of two different peoples. The First World War pitted Britain, France, and Russia against Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. The British, in the shape of the diplomat Sir Mark Sykes, were determined to divide Ottoman territory in a way that best suited them once the war was over, for their own strategic interests. By 1917, the war was shifting in the Allies' favor. And in the Middle East, the British were moving through Sinai towards the borders of historic Palestine. Further north, the Russian Revolution in February 1917 cast doubt on Russia's continued involvement in the war. As Britain and France tried to outmaneuver one another, the British Zionist movement took on increasing political importance. Uh, Sykes wants to get back in touch with uh, Zionists and think about how to incorporate Zionism in British planning for Palestine. And at this moment, we see a hugely important meeting taking place in the home of Moses Gaston in Maida Vale in February of 1917. And this is the point in which uh, Sykes meets for the first time Chaim Weizmann and Nachum Sokolov um, and other Zionists in which it's discussed what the Zionists are looking for um, and the British interest in Zionism. 
So he had to bring the Zionists along without divulging what were the secret agreements that Britain and France had come to with regard to Palestine, which was that they would jointly administer parts of Palestine. At this meeting uh, for the British government was Sykes and Herbert Samuel. He was there. On the other side, there were um, Weizmann and Sokolow, uh, and there was Moses Gaster, and he brought a couple of his allies because he realized that Weizmann was beginning to push him out of the way. The other very important figure was James Rothschild, uh, who attended this meeting. Um, at the meeting, it became clear to Sykes that Weizmann, not Gaster, was the most important Zionist. This is also the moment where Moses Gaster is dislodged. Um, Sykes, his partner on the French side, Pico, hadn't liked Gaster. Gaster had been insistent that there should be a Jewish state and nothing less coming into being after the war. And Pico uh, clearly wanted Zionists who were much more willing to compromise with the interests of the great powers. And Nachum Sokolov and Chaim Weizmann were certainly happy to fit that bill. The meetings between the Zionists and the government seem to give momentum to the idea of British support for a Jewish homeland in Palestine and their potential role in its administration. But the secret Sykes-Picot agreement between Britain and France, which formed the basis of the future division of the Ottoman Empire, planned to put Palestine under international administration. Any change would have to be negotiated with France. Nayem Sokolov emerged as the man to talk to the French. Nahum Sokolov was a doctor in history, a Jewish man who was in Russia, who was born in Arab and was born in Britain. Sokolov became the acknowledged lead diplomat for Zionism. And all the accounts say that he had an extremely sort of elegant bearing and wore very fine clothing and that his manners were uh, polished and polite and smooth, silky smooth, um, so that he could talk um, um, on an equal basis with the representatives of the Germans, Kaiser or the British government or whatever. So the day after the meeting um, between Sykes and the Zionist leaders, Sykes brought Sokolow to meet the French diplomat, uh, Pico. What Sykes wanted was for Sokolow to A, persuade Pico that Zionism must be taken seriously, that Zionism uh, really was the key to winning the war um, um, and that the Zionists would only help the Allies win the war if Britain was the main power in Palestine, not France. François Georges Picot rédige une petite note qu'il remet officiellement à Sokolov que la France encourage ou encouragera Elle est tout à fait d'accord avec la colonisation juive qui tient tant à cœur, qui vous tient tant à cœur en Palestine. Et non seulement ça, mais en plus, les gens du Quai d'Orsay conseillent à Sokolov d'aller à Rome pour s'entendre avec le gouvernement italien. بتحريض من سايكس نفسه انه سوكولوف يروح ورتب له يعني انه يروح على فرنسا ويعملوا هذا الشيء كان خصوصي معمول علشان البريتش كابينت وبتعرف انه التصريح الفرنساوي طلع قبل وعد بلفور علشان بالكابينت الانجليزيه يقولوا انه اوريدي الفرنساويين طلعوا تصريح. It's hard to know how much influence Sykes ultimately had over British policy making. He was given more prominence in British policy making around the Middle East during the war years than he ever deserved. He was a relatively ill-educated, inexperienced man whose only connection to the Ottoman world had been as a tourist. So for this man to be playing such a role in the halls of power over deciding British policy towards the Near East seems to us today to be anomalous, indeed ridiculous. 
Regardless of Sykes's role, things continued to progress for the Zionists. And in June 1917, British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour asked Chaim Weizmann to present his demands as a declaration and promised to try and persuade his government to adopt it. The leading Zionists formed a political committee and drafted their demands, and then submitted them to the British government. This original document was one of the first drafts written at the Imperial Hotel in London on the 17th of July, 1917. It also introduced a new term and concept, the national home of the Jewish people. So in the initial Zionist drafting uh, of the Declaration, um, there were protests amongst Zionist leaders to Nachum Sokolov that there's no mention of the terminology of a Jewish state, that instead they're talking about a national home. And he said that this is a betrayal of what the Zionists are trying to achieve. And Sokolov's response was that we mustn't go too far. We have to take small steps. We have to go with what is acceptable to the British government at this time. And then slowly, slowly, we can advance our cause once we have this in hand. <laughs> المصطلح نفسه مصطلح وطن قومي يعني هذا ليس مصطلح يعني في ذلك الوقت كان القانون الدولي يعني قد نضج إلى حد كبير وكان يمكن أن تستخدم كلمة حكم ذاتي يمكن أن تستخدم كلمة دولة مستقلة وليس في القانون الدولي في مصطلح اسمه وطن قومي يعني ما الذي يعنيه وطن قومي لليهود في فلسطين؟ On the 18th of September 1917 there was a meeting of the British War Cabinet though Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour was absent. The Secretary of State for India, Edwin Montague, who was Jewish, strongly disagreed with the declaration. He was opposed to Zionism and said, I deny that Palestine is today associated with the Jews or properly be regarded as a fit place for them to live. Montague thought a French declaration supporting Zionism in June 1917 was anti-Semitic and negotiated changes to the British version as it went through several drafts. الصيغة تبعت الوعد كان لازم تاخذ بالاعتبار الاعتراضات اللي وضعتها القيادات اليهودية الإنجليزية المعارضة للصهيونية اللي هي بتقول إنه على شرط عدم المساس بالحقوق السياسية لليهود المقيمين في في الدول يعني الغربية. ולכן אגב, כשאתה קורא את הצהרת בנפור, זה לא נכון שלגמרי לא הקשיבו למונטגיו, הקשיבו לו. הוסיפו להצהרת בנפור סעיף שאומר שגם הזכויות האזרחיות המשפטיות של הלא יהודים כאן בארץ לא תיפגענה, אבל גם הזכויות של היהודים בארצותיהם לא תיפגענה. זו תוספת מאוד חשובה, וזה מונטגיו. Secretary of State for War, Viscount Milner, and the Jewish politician, Philip Magnus, sent a modified version to the cabinet. It incorporated some of Montague's changes, including the caveat that, quote, nothing shall be done that might prejudice the rights and political status enjoyed by such Jews who are fully contented with their existing nationality and citizenship. Drafting, especially by Lord Milner, that appeared by September, was closer to the language that would eventually be adopted in November of 1917, namely speaking uh, not about Palestine as as a whole, uh, but uh, a some sort of presence in Palestine uh, on behalf of the Jews. Uh, which is quite different. كانت كل كلمة بوعد بالفور إلها معنى. فالفرق إنك تقول the national home يعني ال التعريف الوطن القومي غير عن إنك تقول a national home وهم يعني تناقشوا فيها قبل ما يصدروا الوعد تناقشوا فيها وقالوا إحنا ما عم نقول بدنا نعطي the national home إحنا بدنا نعطي a national home يعني وطن قومي يهودي في فلسطين. 
The committed Zionists wanted to ensure the declaration was clear that the whole of historic Palestine would be a national homeland exclusively for the Jewish people. The latest draft was sent to Chaim Weizmann, who in turn sent it to the Zionist movement in the United States for their feedback. Uh, there was some consultation you know, during the summer of 1917 uh, with the United States and, and the early drafts that uh, had had the imprint of the Zionist uh, uh, elements in Britain um, would have referred to Palestine uh, in its entirety as being uh, for some sort of Jewish entity. And those elements eventually were modified uh, before the drafting was finalized. Another key part of the terminology that emerged in part of the drafting uh, was in some British redrafting, where instead of for the Jewish people, it was written the Jewish race. Now, eventually this was taken out, but I think it's very revealing that British officials wanted to use this kind of terminology, because after all, this was how they understood the Jews of the world as being a racial group, one that wielded tremendous power and also could be inspired altogether as one unit behind the cause of Zionism supported by Britain and the Allies. It's striking that the existing Arab people in the region were not named at all. They're simply called the, quote, existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. The Jews will be qualified as a people. That means you have the right of the people to dispose of themselves. Tandis que les Arabes, ce sont des communautés. Des communautés non-juives. On ne cite même pas le nom des Arabes. Ce sont des non-juifs qui n'ont que des droits civils et religieux. Ils n'ont pas de droits politiques. Aucun droit politique. By October 1917, the final draft of the Balfour Declaration was ready, awaiting only British government final approval. There was a rumor that Germany was about to issue a similar declaration supporting the rights of the Jews in Palestine. When Balfour heard, he rushed to get his final draft discussed at the cabinet meeting on the 31st of October 1917. So when we think about the centenary of the Balfour Declaration, everyone considers 2nd of November 1917 as the moment of the Declaration itself. But it was actually agreed to by the British Cabinet on the 31st of October. And this was a hugely significant meeting. And in the minutes of that meeting, Balfour uh, reiterates the principal reasons for supporting Zionism and highlights its expected propaganda effects uh, amongst Jews around the world, particularly in the United States and in Russia. The argument was, was put forward most strongly by Lord Balfour at the meeting of October 31st. Uh, and what he argued was that issuing this declaration would be extremely helpful for the British uh, in solidifying the support of the United States uh, and also in countering uh, propaganda from Germany. The critical thing to remember about British diplomatic pronouncements is that what one individual says does not represent the views of the government as a whole. And you will find many different points of view among British officials in the years 1917, 1918, and right into the early years of the mandate. But the British were very clear that they had not promised statehood to the Zionist movement. They had no interest in doing so. The British did not support Jewish nationalism. They did not support Arab nationalism. They supported British imperialism. But this is also the meeting where uh, Lord Curzon who was a member of the War Cabinet, disquiet about the possible effects of supporting Zionism on the Palestinian Arab population and the Palestinian opposition, is completely disregarded. Lord Curzon wrote a paper to the Cabinet asking what was, quote, to become of the people of this country. There were over half a million Syrian Arabs, a mixed community with Arab, Hebrew, Canaanite, Greek, Egyptian and possibly Crusaders' blood. They and their forefathers have occupied the country for the best part of 1,500 years. They own the soil. They profess the Mohammedan faith. 
they will not be content either to be expropriated for Jewish immigrants or to act merely as hewers of wood and drawers of water to the latter. But his prescient remarks fell on deaf ears. It's Sykes who tells Hein Weizmann at the end of the War Cabinet's meeting, Dr. Weizmann, it's a boy, as though they've witnessed the birth of an agreement to create a Jewish national home as a baby in the Middle East. The final draft of the Balfour Declaration was 67 words long. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. Yours sincerely, Arthur James Balfour. Well, in terms of international law, it really has very little standing. In international law, you know, treaties between nations have significance, um, uh, but governments often issue policy statements, statements of intention about what they plan to do, uh, and those really don't have any standing as, uh, as a matter of, of law. Uh, for Britain, this was, uh, I suppose you would say, a statement of its intention as to what it would do if it were to take over Palestine, which, of course, it, it uh, had not yet done uh, as of November 1917. <laughs> היה מכתב שהנוסח ש... שלו סוכם בממשלת בריטניה, לשכת שר החוץ הדפיסה אותו, וכעבור יומיים שלושה שר החוץ חתם עליו ושלח אותו לאחד רוטשילד, שהיה אפילו לא היה ציוני. Two years after the declaration, a church leader in Jerusalem wrote to British Prime Minister Lloyd George about Jews in Palestine trying to control holy sites. Lloyd George's office had said that Chaim Weizmann didn't want to do anything affecting the rights of Arabs. It said he simply wanted to be involved in a council to help provide refuge to Jews fleeing Russia and Eastern Europe. This exchange suggested that Britain felt it had not promised a Jewish state, but simply a place for them to live alongside Arabs. When the League of Nations set out the British mandate in Palestine in 1923, it made Britain responsible for implementing the Balfour Declaration. As a result, Jewish immigration to Palestine increased, as did Arab opposition to it, expressed in a series of Palestinian protests against Britain in the 1920s. They understood the people of Palestine to be Muslims and Christians, but did not imagine that they would constitute a national community that would seek national independence. And after the war, very quickly when it becomes clear that Palestinian Arab nationalists are mobilizing against Zionism, the British government are quick to see a major problem. The Balfour Declaration had put in train a series of events that began to signal its deep flaws. Arab dissent built to the three-year revolt between 1936 and 1939. It was a nationalist uprising against the British administration demanding Arab independence and the end of Jewish immigration. It was in the Peel Commission of 1937 that the British first recognized that instead of balancing communities, they had set in motion a rivalry between incompatible national movements, Jewish and Palestinian Arab. And it was at that point that they tried to solve the problem by dividing Palestine into two states, Arab and Jewish, through a partition plan. And I think there you have the first recognition or admission from British officials of the failure of the Balfour Declaration. In May 1939, the British government published a policy document on Palestine called a White Paper. It abandoned the partitioning of Palestine into two states and called instead for an independent Palestine 
in which Arabs and Jews would share government. It limited Jewish immigration to 75,000 for five years and said that the Arab majority should determine future immigration levels. It also said that Balfour had not meant to create a Jewish state at the expense of the Arabs, any more than the Makman Hussein correspondence 24 years before had promised an Arab state to Sharif Hussein of Mecca. But the white paper met opposition and was dropped. The British government are quick to see a major problem, but there's no way that they can back away from support for Zionism because this becomes the basis for their justification for being in the Holy Land, their commitment to supporting the movement in the Balfour Declaration, which becomes enshrined in international law in the terms of the mandate for Palestine. So the British are stuck with Zionism. They didn't believe that Zionists wanted independent Jewish statehood. And after the war, it became very clear that actually the vast majority of Zionists didn't only want statehood, they expected it. I think if we're trying to assess whether or not Britain's policy towards Zionism in the First World War served British interests or not, the first thing we have to appreciate is the key reason that they supported Zionism was based on an incorrect idea. They believed that they could mobilise something that they saw as Jewish power around the world behind the Allied cause. So first of all, that was entirely wrong and didn't happen because this idea of Jewish power is fake, is false. In September 1939, German expansionism led to the Second World War. Over 60 million people died, including between 5 and 6 million Jews, the majority in Nazi concentration camps. The British mandate ended at midnight on the 14th of May 1948, and immediately the formation of the State of Israel was announced. Justified by the terms of the Balfour Declaration, issued 31 years before. While Israelis celebrated the birth of their nation, 700,000 Palestinians were forced into camps and exile. לכן בלי בריטניה לא הייתה קמה מדינת ישראל, אין ויכוח. בלי הציונים זה לא היה קם, אבל גם בלי בריטניה מדינת ישראל לא הייתה קמה. For Palestinians, the Balfour Declaration represents the moment an imperial power promised their land away to another people. This is the desk where the Balfour Declaration was composed. It is. That's where, that's where Balfour... They hold Balfour responsible for their expulsion, displacement and occupation. <laughs> <laughs> 